Total of negative one x squared. Thank you. Times oh, the natural log of one plus x. Oh yeah. I don't know why that. Oh, IBP, that. baby. All right. This I like that. You recognize that you want to do integration uh, by parts. That's a easy now. So you see, said it. Right, when you see a logarithm as part of your integral and it's not a u du integral, then it's probably a u dd integral. They got that, they got that negative too. But in both cases, the u has to be the logarithm. So, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know why I wrote a negative one, but I'm gonna take u to be the natural log of one plus x, and that leaves my dv. You want to take the one out? You can put it out here. And so dv is x squared times dx. So du is 1 over 1 plus x times the dx. And d is x cubed over 3. So now we write that as uv minus the integral of v du. Can't go much further in that direction. Here's the minus sign. And then I want uv minus the integral of v du. So u times v, I'll put the polynomial term in front, x cubed over 3 times the natural log of 1 plus x. Minus the integral of v, x cubed over 3 times du, integral, 1 over 1 plus x dx. And let me take care of some of these. Let's get rid of those brackets. I'm going to lose that sign bigger than day. So let me go ahead and take care of it now. Take that plus, and let's take that one third out. So look at the second integral and see what your thoughts are on it. Who said it? The degree on top is higher than the degree on the bottom. So we have to do polynomial division. <clears throat> I'm going to take the 1 plus x and write it as x plus 1 and divide into that. So we do it here. x plus 1 divided into the x cubed. So it looks like I need an x squared. And then when I multiply, I get x cubed plus x squared. And, and we subtract. So the x cubes are gone. I bring down the minus x squared. That's still a higher degree. X goes into minus X squared minus X times. Multiplying here gives me minus X squared minus X and subtract. So the X squareds are gone. This becomes a plus X. That's still not lower in degree. So I divide again. Looks to me like it goes one time. One times X plus one goes here. And then we subtract and we get a remainder of negative one. So that integral breaks down to the whole part, x squared minus x plus 1, plus the remainder over the divisor. And we've got to keep the 1 third out front. So let me write it up here. So the first antiderivative term is the minus x cubed over 3 natural log of 1 plus x plus one third of the integral x squared minus x plus one, and then minus one. Hmm. Let's make a, yeah, minus one over one plus x dx. And I think we can do them all now, right? The final answer will be minus x cubed over three natural log of one plus X plus one third of another X cubed over three 
minus an x squared over two plus x minus the natural log of one plus x. That's our arbitrary constant. And I liked that problem. I thought that was pretty cool. Are there any others in there? Right on. Got the whole assignment done too. Good. I was really glad that I forgot to open it up for you because now it made you refresh closer to exam time. We should put the exam on Monday. Don't you feel like you're ready for the test? No. 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 Well, we'll be ready by the end of time. So. I want Monday and Tuesday to like work on the study packet. Oh. And this weekend to do hey. some. I think Monday. I'm just thinking about all the grading I got to do. I got two tests on Tuesday and two on Wednesday. I'll never get my grading done. Do you, do you, back do you Friday, really grade all your trades? Do all Friday of them? Work all of them. Is it well, like 400? Yes. Well, maybe this time there's there's quite a drop off in the number of students already. I don't know how many is still in the class because I don't get to see who's dropped and who quit. But there's, you know, in the class that used to have 150, maybe there's 60 that show up, and there's probably another 20 online. The rest of them, I have no idea. Right now, you have a 50 percent drop rate. Probably. Yes. A lot of my classes seem to have less and less people show up every day. I mean, yeah. That's not going to fly at work when you guys are employed. No. You can't just say, I don't, yeah, I don't know. No, that don't work. It does work if you're self employed, though. <laughs> not if you want to make a living. <laughs> well, yeah, that, those are just details, though. If you're self employed, you'll probably work harder than most people. Absolutely. You've got you to count on. I saw a joke and it was like, I quit my nine to five and now I work 24 seven. Yeah, I quit my nine to five to work from home, work for myself, and now I don't live, I just work. That's right, there's no life. You're not gonna have a life in your first job anyway. Well done, no more integration? No proper integrals, anybody working on that one yet? I'm not sure yet, that was a pretty easy section. Yeah. I think so. Okay, then we're going to talk about sequences and what makes a sequence converge. So we're going to, have to dig back into our little memories on how to take limits and how to use L'Hopital's rule. Talk about the major equations and things like that. Okay. Well, in terms of using our little memories, I don't exactly have a favorite one. <laughs> so, like, mine stops at like. After I came back, you got to purge. You got some things in there. You just got to purge. Like, oh man, do, some clear, do you do you know like your mother's birthday? It's gonna be like song. Oh, you got to purge that one. <laughs> then I'm talking about maybe locker combinations from when you were in high school. I still remember those. I don't really choose. I remember it's just some random stuff that comes and goes. You know? hey man, I, I got I got too many song lyrics in my head. <laughs> well, those are important. Well, I know. No, every, I, mean, I know, like every single lyric, to every single code. Maybe I can give her some of those. <laughs> yeah, that's like the most common. Taylor Swift. Okay, so remember what we talked about in sequences last time. Where are we? We're in section eight point one. October fifteenth. It is October fifteenth. Uh oh, I think I just ran out of things. So we denoted a sequence with these cute little brackets, and then we put the general term inside here, some sort of formula for it. And what that means is that I make a list of subscripted numbers, A1, A2, A3. Say we go out here somewhere to AK. The one right before it would have a subscript one fewer. And the one right after it would be K plus one. But it's an infinite sequence, an infinite list of numbers. For example, the sequence, 
whose general term looks like one over two n minus one. Can you list for me the first five terms of that sequence? One. <laughs> 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 third, Is third, and then one fifth, and then the pattern continues where the denominator grows by two. One, two, three, four, five. Right. So we start with the counting number one. Two times one minus one gives us give us one. One over one is one. Now n is two. Two times two is four. Minus one is three, and then so on. So n is acting as the dummy variable as that's the counter for our um, whole numbers. Okay, can you look at what happens, say if I'm out at the 80th term? What does, what is? One over 159. A 80 is one over two times 80 minus one. Is one over 159, All right? So that's what we mean by general formula. Now, I've given you also that some sequences can be described with recursive formula. But recursive formulas aren't going to be very helpful to us. I want to see if you can read one. So let's let a1 equal 3 and a n equal um, a n minus 1 squared plus 2. Can you list me the next four terms of this sequence? So this, I've given you A1, so this is value for N, two or more. So if N is two, it says A2 is equal to A1 squared plus two. Well, we have A1, A1 is three, right? This let n be two. We have a two is a one squared plus two. A one was three, so I have nine plus two is eleven. Now it's your turn. A three. One over two over three. Okay, the eleven squared plus two. 121 plus 2 is 123. And I think this game has gotten old, hasn't it? <laughs> I, so the next one is 123 squared plus 2. Blah, blah, blah. Which is like a little more than 15,000. <laughs> That's yeah. big. Very cool. And the next game is, didn't quite get old fast enough. For me. Okay. Um, let's look at some more. So this recursive ones aren't helpful because it's, I'd like to go way on out and see what's what the behavior of the expression is way on out. If I wanted to know even the 10th term on this particular example, it's going to take a while to get there. I can't just jump to it. I have to get the previous nine terms. Can you? Can you? Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's not quite the most. Okay. So what you would do is you would say three squared plus two squared plus two squared plus two squared. I, I mean, that's it's less work, but it's still oh, a lot of work. Okay. All right. So we can, but we couldn't write a formula for it, could yeah. we? No, right? so. a, gen a general formula from the recursive formula. Sometimes we fall into it, but we could kind of compound it like you just said. So we're going to, our goal is to come up with a general formula or use the general formula to tell us some things. So here's some more general formulas. I want you to write out, write out their terms. So let's call that one number one. There's, that one was just for funsies. Here's number two. Let's look at n divided by n plus one. Give me the first few terms of that one. 
And then number three, negative one to the N. Do they always start with one? If not, we'll tell you if they don't. But N represents a counting number. If you ever wanted to start at zero, we would tell you. Adam. So let's see if n is one, I get one half. If n is two, two thirds. two thirds. The numerator is always one smaller than the denominator. Over here, if n is one, I'm at negative one. If n is two, I'm at positive one and negative one and positive one and so on. It's an annoying sequence. I don't know why I don't want to. Yeah, I like it. A sequence represents a function, a pairing between the counting numbers and these real numbers. So a picture of a sequence, a picture of this sequence right here. And here is one, two, three, four. Those are the ends. These are the A ends. And let me change the scale and make that a one up here. So I get A1 is one, A2 is a third, A3 is a fifth, and then so on. So it looks like that if I did this pattern forever, that this particular sequence I can predict when N is really large, what the M term looks like. What does it look like? Zero. This sequence is said to have a limit of zero. So um, whenever we do look in that, when we whenever we say a very large, are we looking at infinity or are we looking at very large? We're looking at a big number, and then we're going to let that big number go to infinity. So we're going to say that this sequence converges to zero. In general, a sequence converges to a limit L if this general term goes to L as N goes to infinity. Let me write that down somewhere up here. A sequence, A, N, said to converge, to L if the limit as N goes to infinity of the general term is that number L. And as a picture, <clears throat> sequence represents a list of points. Now at the beginning, they might bounce around a bit, but then once we get past a certain big N, all of those values out here live in a very tiny interval around L. They all live in a very tiny interval around L whenever N is bigger than N. For that second sequence, <laughs> we converge to one. It does, because? We go to infinity over infinity. All right, what, is, what do we do when you encounter infinity? Over infinity. Do L'Hopital's rule. Which says we take the limit of the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the top is one, the derivative of the bottom is one. So that has a limit of L. Or we can just do looking at the highest power, right? If the two powers are the same, then the limit is just going to be the ratio of the coefficients. Remember doing that? 
This one has no limit. Because of the oscillation. This one looks like this. When X is one, Y the limit, the value is negative one. When X is two, the value is positive one. And three goes back to negative one, positive one. Negative one, positive one. Right? Kind of like a sign graph? Except it's not continuous, it's just a sequence of points. Oh, okay. Right? So it has no limit because there's no one number L that all of these <clears throat> fluctuate toward when L is big. So that one has no limit whatsoever. So that sequence diverges because it has no limit. This sequence converges to zero, and this sequence converges to one. Sequence converges if it has a limit. So let me get you to compute some limits. Side whether following sequences converge if they converge to what? Ended the sentence with a proposition, so I don't know how to fix that. First one, let's look at the sequence whose general term looks like n to the fourth plus 3n cubed minus 1 divided by 2n to the fourth plus n minus 4. You know what I would have done as a top one student? I would have got my calculator out and put a thousand in for n and then see what the number was approximately because I was lazy. Why don't you just put <laughs> Use my calculator. Like, well, not with your calculator. Like, we so don't need calculators. Yes, sir. It's just the ratio of equations. I want the answer because you can get the answer before I write the problem down. Where is the one, one half? half? Yeah. Because of what we just said before. If you take the limit as n goes to infinity, you get the limit as n goes to infinity. This has no limit. Because what we just said before, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, this has the property that the numerator is infinitely large, and so is the denominator. <coughs> so I'm going to show you a couple of ways that we did this in calculus one. Before we learned L'Hopital's rule, right? So we knew that we could use L'Hopital's rule down the line when we recognized that form. But before we learned L'Hopital's rule, we said, well, this expression is guided by the highest power on n. And so what we're going to do is scale this down by that power. I'm going to divide every term here by n to the fourth. We're not going to do limits like this. We're going to do it by eyeballing it. But this justifies why we can say that. And to the fourth is what guides the behavior of this one. N is a large number. So we're going to tamp it down a bit. Now I'm going to reduce that expression. This becomes one, 
The next one looks like three over N. The next one is simplified already. So what term here is a two, one over N cubed minus four over N to the fourth. And now we're gonna think, well, what happens when I take a big number and divide it into three or take a big number, make it bigger and then divide it into one? All of those disappear pretty quick, right? Everything that's gonna have an N in the denominator when N gets large, those fractions are gonna to go to zero. And that's what gives us the one half. But as I said before, we don't need to do that because after doing that enough times, you're gonna see, well, duh, we'll just be left with the ratio of the coefficients if the power on top is the same as the power on the bottom. What happens if the power on the bottom is bigger? What if I had an n squared plus one here? And maybe an n cubed plus eight here. You did those same steps. What would you find out is your limit? Zero. Because the highest power is on bottom, right? So those are bottom heavy. The bottom grows faster than the top. So eventually the bottom is gonna overwhelm the top and make this fraction go to zero. Highest power on the bottom, if I divide everything by n cubed, I would have a one over n, a one over n cubed, one, and an eight over n cubed. And now all those terms go to zero that have the n on the bottom, leaving us with a zero over a one. So you can kind of look at the degree on top and the degree on the bottom. Even if they're not polynomials, you can kind of do that. Let's look at the next two. Let's look at e to the minus n as the general term. So e to the minus one, e to the minus two, e to the minus three. Those are the terms in this sequence. So you have a limit of zero, right? Because negative power means it's on the bottom. So I've got stuff on the bottom that grows while this numerator is just a constant. So for the same reason as these things going to zero, this goes to zero in a hurry. So what if I did something, looked at a sequence like this? I would say that, wouldn't it be bottom heavy when you get up to long? That's right. Really, really, really long. E to a power grows fast. Even though n to the 50 could be pretty big, e to a power grows big time fast. Isn't this like zero times infinity? Well, not if I put it like this. If I put it like that, it's infinity over infinity. So think about doing L'Hopital's rules, say about 50 times, and you get a constant on top eventually, but on the bottom, you're always gonna have an e to the n. So you're gonna have a constant divided by e to the n after 50 applications of L'Hopital's rule, which means your limit's gonna be zero. Okay. Polynomial terms don't grow as fast as exponential functions. Even n to the 10th divided by two to the n. If I cut down the size of the exponential function, it's still gonna to go to zero because exponential functions grow faster. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. How about, how about, how about about this sequence here? What was the name of the guy that went crazy for studying infinities? I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
other there's not that many mathematicians okay. that didn't go crazy <laughs> it's a tough life you know when you're inventing mathematics all right i don't know what number i'm on four five four five five So with n squared plus 5n minus n. So it's a general formula, right? Looks like first term would be square root of 6 minus 1. Second term would be four, square root of 14 minus 2. Third term would be 9 plus 15 is more than I can do. 24 minus 3. All right, goofy looking terms, but it's still a sequence of real numbers. But when I call out that sequence of real numbers, it's hard to kind of look at that and see what happens to it. So I'm gonna see if you can remember how to take a limit like this. Infinity? Yeah. How would you say that? The left side grows faster than the right side, so it's eventually gonna power and make infinity. Hmm. This gets infinitely large and so does that, right? So it looks like this. And that is an indeterminate form. Zero. It's not zero. <laughs> it's bigger than the right infinite though? I don't know. In this case it's not. Welcome to the so this is gonna this is gonna converge to a finite number. We have to uh, by we have to what? Yeah. We thought about something? Yeah, let's multiply by something. Right? We we have L'Hopital's rule that takes us to the gets us away from the indeterminate form infinity over infinity. But we have other indeterminate forms, this being one of them. Some other indeterminate forms are zero times infinity. Um, we have some exponential infinite forms. Um, let's see if I can remember all of them. Zero, <laughs> zero, one to the infinity. I even think zero to the infinity might be one of them. None of these forms allow you to use L'Hopital's rule unless you do some algebra to them first to get them in the form of infinity over infinity. So the algebra here is, well, let's make a fraction out of it. It does look like infinity over infinity. So we are going to take this thing here and multiply it by one. But you can't just pick any over four. I don't want to multiply it by three over three. I want to multiply it by something that helps me get it in the form of infinity over infinity. Right. Multiply by the conjugate, right? Remember the old days when we clear things like this out of the denominator, we multiply top and bottom by the same expression change the sign in the middle so that we're essentially using the property that a minus b times a plus b is a squared minus b squared and if a or b has a radical sign then we lose it so we're going to multiply by the conjugate multiply by one in the form of the conjugate So here's what I'm going to multiply it by. I'm going to keep the limit writing along for a bit. Copy this down. n squared plus 5n minus n over 1. And we'll multiply top and bottom by that n squared plus 5n plus n. I'm going to have you multiply out the top. I'll multiply out the bottom. Why do you make us get the easy job? I uh, just, I feel for you. Carefully multiply out the top and tell me what you got left. Five then. Yep. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> I'm just really good. 
I hope you were really careful because that's what I got. Oh, so you got five in? Yeah. I'll do more slowly then. That times that gives me n squared plus five n. Two inside terms give you the same thing with opposite and sign. That was the point. I'm not going to get anything from those products. And then the last product would be a minus n squared. So by gosh, by golly, you do get a five n. Did you intend that? Well, at least now I have it in the indeterminate form of infinity divided, divided by infinity. Yes. So you think, okay, it's infinity divided by infinity. I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule. Take the derivative of the top and divide it by the derivative of the bottom. See what happens. The forewarning that L'Hopital's rule works like crap when you got square roots in there. It's not going to work. But I'm going to show you that it's not. Again, I'm going to help you. The derivative of the top is five. Can you tell me what the derivative of the bottom is? Well, one half times n squared plus five n is a negative one half plus one, I think. Times two times two. Look inside. Oh, and plus five that part. plus one. Okay, well, now let me rewrite that. Five right here. Let's simplify this a bit. Let's put two n plus five here. N squared plus five n to the one half there. Somewhere I got a two. Let's just flip and multiply and put the two up here. Right? And then I got a plus one down here. Um, did the one change because you moved the two? Oh, yeah, that's a bummer. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I guess my two is going to stay here. Okay. That didn't work like crap. And then can we do it again and get zero over something? Well, I don't, I, I got the indeterminate form here, right? So if I simplified this, I could get a common denominator here. I could do this. Oh, no. Just just stop. <laughs> you, you can, it's okay. We're getting radical. We, we see where you're going with this. No, we, believe we, we believe you. Plus the denominator. <laughs> Oops. Right, yeah, something like that. They get the common denominator and then take that denominator and flip it up, give or take some constants. I'll take your word for it. We're worse, right? We're worse off than we were. And if you keep taking derivatives of square roots, you're going to get a negative one half, which puts it in the bottom. This one's going to put one back in the top. I'm always going to have. Thing going up and down with square root signs. I'm stay, I'm going to stay in infinity over infinity for freaking ever. For infinity? For infinity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worn out. I like to not do this. So we've got to be able to go back to here, right? We get an infinite loop, always of the form infinity over infinity. So L'Hopital's rule really works poorly with square root terms. Because they keep showing up. I don't know if I hyphenated that. So we've got to go back here and try to analyze this a little bit better. The way I did it earlier by thinking about when n is large, it's the highest power of n that controls the behavior of this sequence of this term. So I can see the highest power of n on top is n to the first power. What about on the bottom? N to the yeah, first. N to the first it's power. also n to the first. This is behaving like an n to the first power. And so is that. So I'm going to take every term in here and divide by n to the first. 
but I'm going to divide this by the square root of n squared, which will be my version of n to the first. So instead of doing this, instead of doing this, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to divide everything by n. And in order to get it into the radical sign, I'm going to make it look like the square root of n squared. <clears throat> right? Well, for n positive, and n is a large positive number in this example. So I've pulled it inside like that. And now I can kind of look at what the behavior of each term is in the long run. Looks like a five on top. One plus five over n squared here, plus one there. And just like you told me, this thing goes to five halves. Right? Oh, yeah, goes to zero. Numerator stays at five. And there's an example where infinity minus infinity is not zero. Five halves. <laughs> Some infinities, man, they're weird. Infinity leads to all kinds of absurd things. Infinity <laughs> minus infinity is not, it's not infinity and it's not zero, it's everything. Everything and then some. Yeah, I could adjust that to be almost any number you want it to be. Not this morning. Okay, so I want to see how we attack these indeterminate forms as well. We did one of these last time, but I'm going to do one again just to see if you remember. So, number six. Let's look at terms of a sequence that look like. N times the sine of one over N. No, one over the sine is the cosecant, but not the sine of one over N. Difference. Limit. As n goes to infinity, that gives you like zero times infinity, right? It does because inside here, one over n goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Sine of zero is zero, and this is infinity. So it has this form, things like infinity times zero. So again, if you remember your Cal 1, we tried to do some algebra to put it in the form of either infinity over infinity or zero over zero. Remember what it was that we did? Um, okay, so you're gonna move the n to the denominator as one over n. Multiplying by n is equivalent to dividing by 1 over n. Mm, that's an identity where the limit is 1. It would, but it's going to be 1. Okay. But it's not really an identity yet. Right? The identity is, is sine x. the sine x over x as x goes to 0 has a limit of 1. I can do this one with L'Hopital's rule though. So you don't have to remember that special limit because now I have it in the right form. Now it's in what form? Which form is this in? Zero over zero. Zero over zero. Zero over zero allows me to do L'Hopital's rule. So take the derivative of the top, divide it by the derivative of the bottom, and then try to take the limit of what you get. Don't forget to take the derivative inside when you take the derivative of the top. And the sine is a cosine. What's the derivative of one over n? Negative one two over n squared. Right. No, it's negative two. How about a negative one? Yes. Yes. 
So it's the derivative inside and the derivative of the bottom that matches and we can cancel them. So we're left to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the cosine of one over n. These will cancel. What's that limit? One. Zero is one. Okay. What's this limit going to be? Four. Oh, wait, yeah. If I change this to a four over n, it still goes to zero, right? Oh, yeah. So this would be a four over n, and that's a one over n. And so when I take the derivative of four over n, I get a negative four over n squared. So one over the negative one over n squared cancel and we'd get four. For the same reasons. Okay, so that's typically what we do. If we have this form, we usually write one of the terms reciprocal in the denominator. And it kind of helps if one of the terms is just a, a polynomial type term. And then we can get it in the form of zero over zero and then do L'Hopital's rule. When we have these exponential forms, we've got to work a little bit harder to get them in a form for L'Hopital's rule. Let's see if you remember how to work hard. Next example, number seven. That one. The sequence of terms we're talking about here, like one half to the one, two thirds squared, three fourths cubed, four fifths to the fourth, and so on. So what this looks like if you were to write out the first so many terms. So it looks like, I don't know, what does that look like to you? Zero, zero. Zero? Fractions get smaller and smaller each time as you add it. My fractions are getting bigger, aren't they? Yeah, but when you multiply yeah. fraction, sometimes it gets smaller. Yeah, fractions that are less than uh, one. The fractions are getting right bigger. So these are going to one, and those are going to make those things go to zero. Is that what you're telling me? I don't believe you for one minute. This is nowhere near going to zero. So you told me the stuff inside goes to one, the power goes to infinity. And that's an indeterminate form of the exponential variety. <coughs> if we want to use L'Hopital's rule, I don't even want to have an exponent in there. I at least want to have a product. Right? So what do we have that tells exponents to go from here to here? A logarithm, right? I'm going to use a logarithm to bring that down. So I'm going to pretend that I know the limit. It's L. And I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. And I can move logarithms all the way inside limits, limits outside of logarithms and vice versa. So I'm going to have the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of the expression on the left. And then I have the natural log of L on the right. But I used a logarithm so we can use that log property and bring this down in front. And I think now this has the form of infinity times zero, if you agree with me. If n goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. Inside here, we said that goes to 
one. What's the natural log of one? So there we go. We've got it in the form like that. So we're going to mimic what we did here. We're going to take the n from here, and we're going to put its reciprocal down there so that it behaves like zero over zero. And now we have the right form to do L'Hopital's rule. We'll take the derivative of the top, divide it by the derivative of the bottom, simplify, simplify, and see if we can take the limit from there. So let's talk about how you're going to take the derivative of the top. What's the derivative of the log of u? 1 over u times u prime. 1 over u times u prime. So the u prime is going to be a little quotient rule action. Take your time. Be careful. I'll go ahead and take the derivative of the bottom while you do that. The derivative of the bottom is negative one over n squared. Yep, you're going to do the one over u, u prime. The one over u is easy. I flip that over. Now, in here, you're doing the quotient rule of that stuff. At the bottom times the derivative of the top. Well, the derivative of the top is just one. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. That's one over the bottom squared. Let's simplify inside there. Let's see. See that far? Leave this here as n plus one over n. I take the parentheses away, the two n subtract each other out. So I have one over n plus one squared. And then I've got a negative one over n squared. I'm gonna go ahead and flip and multiply and make that an n squared over negative one up here. Okay, with all that, now I can do some canceling. I can take one of the n plus ones out of here. I can take an n out of here. And I just have a negative n over n plus one. I don't need equal signs here. I got equal signs there. All right, what's the limit there on the left? Infinity over infinity or negative infinity. Okay, do a little Patel's rule again. Negative one, right? So I have negative one. Well, that's not my limit. That's the natural log of my limit. What's the limit if that's the natural log of the limit? How do I solve this equation for L? Uh, raise negative one or e to the negative yeah. one. Yeah, e to both sides. So I get e to the negative one is e to the natural log of l. And e to the natural log of l is l. But just like you told me, this is going to one over e. It converges to one over e. Not sure. Yeah. That was hilarious. <clears throat> And that's kind of the standard trick to take things out of the exponential indeterminate form.
Ah, here we go. Let's look at this one. Where's, where did I let this dry? Oh, in all kinds of goofy places. <laughs> this is where I started. Let's get that out of the way. These general terms. Some of them, none of them, all of them. Okay, what's the limit of the first one? This is what you're thinking, so I'll put it in the cloud, right? Negative one over infinity goes to zero, so it behaves like 10 to the zero. <laughs> goes to one. Gotcha. Can you tell about the middle one? Does it have a one limit? Half. Is it one half? Yeah. It is one half. Because? Instincts and gut feelings. Instincts and gut feelings. Well, the last one you told me your gut feeling was that it went to zero. Yeah, exactly. So, so this would be a little anything. bit more deliberate. Can you prove to me that the limit of the middle one is one half? Divide lazy per second and get rid of the one. Yeah. yeah. Divide both sides by n. Divide everything by n, right? So I can take n and divide it by n. I can divide this by n. But in order to get that inside, I got to think of that as a square root of n squared. And so I can rewrite that expression as one over the square root of four plus one over n squared. And so the limit as n goes to infinity of that thing is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of that rewritten expression. Anything that has an n in the denominator is going to go to zero. So I'm left with one over the square root of four, which makes that go to a half. Does C just go to some constant? Sure. It's a constant. I don't know. <laughs> I got, I think. You can simplify it to ln e over ln 3 plus ln 5. Ooh, can't just distribute a logarithm. Can't distribute a logarithm through a sum. That would be fun, though. We're going to do this one by looking like we did for the highest power of x. Which one's the highest exponential function? 5. 5 is bigger, right? e is 2.7-ish. So the two fellers down there on the bottom grow a lot faster than the one on the top. So it's considered to be bottom heavy. What's going to happen in the long run? Zero. zero. It's going to go to zero. 
You see, that's what my instinct says. And then I was like, well, it must be wrong then. What if I move this one up top? Anything change? No. Oh, it depends. If you add three to E to the N, it'd be bigger than I to the N. Addition is significantly less important than. That's right. Kind of uh, see if you believe this BS that I'm about to write. This is roughly like E to the N plus three to the N over five to the N is smaller than three to the N plus three to the N over five to the N. I'll just replace that with a number bigger. I can add those two and get two of them. Now that's equal to. And so now I have two times three over five to the N. So this is smaller than that. So now I'm going to take the limit of both sides. What's happening? Not equal, less than. Take three fifths and raise it to higher and higher and higher powers. If this number is smaller than one, it's going to go to zero. If this number is bigger than one, it goes to infinity, right? So this is going to go to zero. These are a bunch of positive numbers added together. <clears throat> so this limit has to be something less than or equal to zero. And it's positive, so it has to be equal to zero. God, that handwriting is terrible. It's because I didn't get my second cup of coffee. So this limit is zero. It's bounded above by a sequence that goes to zero. So our sequence has to go to zero. <laughs> Okay. God, I can't even read that. Pretend I didn't write it. That looks terrible. <laughs> Explain someone. It's kind of a there. dominated convergence, right? If one sequence, I'm going to draw this continuous line, but a sequence is just a bunch of dots. But if one sequence does that, and our sequence lives underneath it, this is going to L, and our sequence lives underneath it, then it also has to go to L. So if I can prove a bigger one goes to L, then the smaller one has to as well. Very. All right. It's pretty much it. It's some version of that. Right? The squeeze theorem was a way that we proved that the limit as n goes to infinity of sine n over n is going to be one. A little squeezing on it. Okay, how about this? Um, does this have a limit? Oh gosh, that's terrible. Red? <laughs> Where'd the black one go? Gotcha. <laughs> the I mean, it is, we, we have the edge of the frame. Am I? Yeah. That was such a good problem. <coughs> My black one go. Could be this one. Could this be the missing? <laughs> well, since I will wear a disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move over so we can see it. All right. I want to know if this sequence converges or not. So to what? <coughs> Does that have a letter? Probably. Probably? I'm going with no. Yeah, I just asked him to. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I asked you first. They asked me in the office why I use so many markers. I've used this marker in two classes, and look, it's already getting faint. It's trying to shame me into using less markers. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep, keep getting them. What did I tell you about a fraction to the n? With the 
than zero is zero. If the stuff inside is smaller than one, it's going to go to zero. If the stuff inside is bigger than one, it's going to go to infinity. So I know this term goes to zero. So we can just ignore it. We can add zero to our limit over there. Do you remember what the arctangent does when n is large? This is zero. That means you haven't done your 7.7 integration. It does go to pi over two. It does go to pi over two. Does why? What's the tangent look like? Tangent has these vertical asymptotes at pi over two and negative pi over two. So when you do the arc tangent, y's become x's, x's become y's. So it's bounded between negative pi over two and pi over two. The arc tangent of n, there's the pi over two. There's the negative pi over two. It does this, it goes through the origin. So as x goes to positive infinity, arctangent goes to pi over two. In the last section, we needed to be able to integrate to minus infinity. As x goes to minus infinity, the arctangent goes to minus pi over two. So the area under that curve would be zero. Is it symmetric? Well, I didn't integrate anything, but you're right. So this is going to go to pi over two. So this sequence has a limit of pi over two. Okay. So I'm going to give you something called the tower of power. Power of power describes how fast things grow. I think there's like a water slide named that. <laughs> 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 probably rides no, for there sure is something. I gotta look it up now. There, there is a water slide. Like, I have definitely heard something. You know what grows really, 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 really slow, but still grows? Tortoises. <laughs> a logarithm. Natural log of n grows real slow. It grows even slower than the square root of n. I'm sorry, it's called the power tower. <laughs> You're still pretty good. And then n grows, right? Suppose this were maybe a cube root. A cube, a cube root grows slower than a square root. Square root grows, grows slower than n. And then as I increase powers up here, I can go, you know, n squared, n cubed, n whatever. And then I'll have my exponential function. So maybe two to the n goes faster. If I increase the base, then it grows faster. E to the n grows slower than three to the n. Three to the n grows slower than 10 to the n. 10 to the n grows slower than this guy, the excited n. What does the excited n mean? Vectorial. What does that mean? n times n minus one, times n minus two, times n minus three. So it's almost like n to the n, right? Almost, but not quite. n to the n grows faster than that. That's hard. So if you have things stacked up like that and you want to know, is my expression top heavy or bottom heavy, you can lean on this tower of power. If the n to the n is going to be on the bottom, it's going to take the whole expression to zero. Is it more like a question mark? Again? Isn't there a question mark? A question mark? Yeah, like in math? Yeah, doesn't it represent? I, I feel like I've seen. I've that. never seen a question mark in math. Well, I could be wrong. <laughs> what's smaller than ln to the n? Like, what's smaller than that? Smaller than the square root of n. <laughs> <laughs> square root of the natural log of n. The natural log of the natural log of n. Ah, very good. We can keep getting smaller. But so, if you see that, and you see something like this. And you want to take a limit as n goes to infinity. You can do that just by using your tower of power. Or you can use Locatel's rule. Looks like infinity over infinity, but which one grows faster? The top grows faster. I'm done. I have a follow up on the question mark. Okay. In mathematics, the mean Kautsky question mark denoted by question mark to the x is a function possessing various unusual fractal, fractal properties defined by Herman Minkowski. 
It maps quadratic irrationals to rational numbers on the unit interval by an expression relating the continued fraction expansions. Oh, wow, this is hard to read. <laughs> of the quadratics to the binary expansions of rationals given by Arnaud Denjoy in 1938. In addition, it maps rational numbers to, I don't even know what that is, dyadic <laughs> rationals. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff in math. I this is why the mathematicians go crazy. No, walk like, by any of these boards no, that are announcing uh, a math talk and just try to read what the math is it, talk is. is. Question mark and then an X and punctuation to a power of X. <laughs> punctuation to a random letter in the alphabet. Okay, what I want you to do over the weekend, get some sleep, some exercise, do a little bit of calculus, like eight hours. Do <laughs> seven, 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 yeah. seven, seven. Do well, the review so sheet that I posted so that on Monday I have some idea of what you need to know for your test on Wednesday. Test on Wednesday is entirely over chapter seven. This is chapter eight, so this will be on your third test. Okay. A three test and a final. And I think I'm here for the final. I, I have a handful of graded papers up here, but I can't read now because I just got the word in my eye. Next in the morning. I would say it's. Oh, the I also need to Red, bad, red, good. <laughs> see, I've, been waiting. I've been waiting. I've been waiting to see if it's colder outside. If I want to take it off or not. It's probably like sixty. Yes, yeah, if it's sixty, I'll probably probably should have taken it off like an hour ago. I gotta run it real quick. My guess is sixty-three. Questions or long questions? I was going silly. I'm not making a guess. See, you took off your jacket too. I took off. I did hot here. I should have taken it off. It is fifty-four. Okay, good. Let's go do it right now. You know, haven't done anything of like making. You haven't moved anything. No. Okay. You have a minor. What's your minor? You probably need to declare a minor. Yeah. You're gonna. Do you have more than forty-five hours yet? Time is going. Bye. Have a good trip. Thanks. Yeah, I was like, don't Yes. After the semester.